This man developed one of the most controversial philosophical theories in antiquity. His name is Epicurus, and his philosophical school, called the Garden, sought to teach ancient Athenians how they could achieve a state of pain-free happiness and true understanding. He emphasized the nourishment and nurturing of the body and soul, and laid the early groundwork for one of the most significant scientific discoveries in human history. Yet his thoughts on how the world works and how to live a good life were rejected by his contemporaries and in later centuries ridiculed as pure hedonism. But is this a fair assessment of Epicurus's philosophy? Who was Epicurus? How did he live? And what did he teach? And why are his ideas so polarizing? My name is Kate, and welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. Epicurus grew up on the island of Samos, near modern-day Turkey, in the 4th century BCE. His parents, who had three other sons, were Athenian citizens. They educated their children in the most popular philosophical ideas of the day, including the work of Plato, who had died seven years before Epicurus was born. But for Epicurus, Plato's teachings didn't hold up in the ever-expanding world. At the time, Athens had already lost considerable power and influence following the Peloponnesian War, and a new superpower was on the rise, the Macedonians under Alexander the Great. When Epicurus was seven years old, Alexander invaded Persia. For some time, Greece was the major power in the ancient Mediterranean. But when Alexander died in 323 BCE, when Epicurus was just 18 years old, fighting among his successors broke the Greek hegemony apart. One of Alexander's successors, the general Perdiccas, expelled all Athenian settlers from Samos, including Epicurus and his family. They traveled to Colophon, where Epicurus continued his studies in philosophy. His early influences were the Cynics and the pre-Socratic thinker Democritus, who first put forth the theory of atomism. Democritus and his predecessor Leucippus argued that all matter was composed of tiny particles, which he called atoms because they couldn't be divided. These atoms, which connect to other atoms to form all the shapes we see, exist in a void, a space which itself is formless and massless. Democritus theorized that the whole of the universe could be divided into these two categories, atoms and the void they exist within. Expanding on Democritus's work, Epicurus theorized that no matter can be spontaneously created, nor can anything that once existed be destroyed. Rather, all matter, when it seems to be destroyed, is simply broken down again into atoms, invisible to the naked eye. Likewise, when something grows, what we're witnessing is the joining together of invisible atoms. Epicurus also proposed that all atoms are in a constant state of motion. Some simply oscillate in place, while others fly across great distances. But, he added, we can't always predict the way that atoms will move. 
At times, atoms have the capacity to swerve unexpectedly, deviating from their course. The theory of the swerve explained, for Epicurus, the randomness we can observe in nature, and how humans have free will in an otherwise deterministic universe. Epicurus taught his version of atomic theory first at Mytilene, where he was expelled for being too controversial, then at Lampsacus, before settling in Athens when he was 34 or 35 years old. There he set up a philosophical school he called the Garden, situated between Plato's Academy and the burgeoning Stoic school, founded by Epicurus's contemporary Zeno. At the Garden, Epicurus sought to distance himself from other philosophers, especially from Plato, whose work he found lacking in every respect. He instructed his pupils in a variety of subjects, epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, and, of course, atomism. His popularity grew, despite passionate criticism from other intellectuals, bringing in students from all walks of life. Unlike the other philosophical schools of the day, the garden did not limit who could come and learn from the sage. Women and even enslaved people found refuge and wisdom within the garden's walls, something that earned Epicurus a reputation for surrounding himself with prostitutes and engaging in hedonistic debauchery. His teachings were already controversial. Early critics accused him of plagiarizing Democritus's work, especially since Epicurus insisted that he was self-taught. Rumors spread of the garden's gluttonous banquets, which saw Epicurus gorging himself on rich foods and loose women, only to purge midway through the evening so that he could binge again. What Epicurus was teaching, the accusations claimed, was no philosophy at all but a series of half-baked and half-stolen ideas packaged as an excuse to behave immoderately. This reputation likely wasn't helped by the sign above the garden's doors. Stranger, you will do well to stay here. Here, pleasure is the highest good. But what did Epicurean pleasure look like? The accusation of hedonism seems to be unfairly leveled against Epicurus and his students. According to Diogenes Laertius, our best source for Epicurus's life and writings, Epicurus taught that pleasure was, simply put, the absence of pain. He called it aponia, a pain-free state of contentment. This was true pleasure, lasting pleasure, not the fleeting joys of food, drink, and sex. In fact, Epicurus never married, nor did he have any children. Diogenes Laertius quotes a letter of Epicurus which explains the difference. For a never-ending string of drinks and parties, the enjoyment of children and women, of fish and other things which the expensive table bears, these do not make life become sweet. But rather, it is sober logic and searching out the causes of all choice and fear, and driving out beliefs from which the greatest turmoil takes over our souls. Epicurus thought that gluttony and excess arise from irrational thoughts and fears, and that releasing these fears brought about natural pleasure and contentment, so that there would be no need to chase ever more exotic delights. He called this state of contentment ataraxia, peace in the absence of anxiety. Anxiety, he argued, comes from an irrational fear of death, as if it were a horribly painful event, and as if one were to suffer after it. These fears arise from a theology that preaches divine retribution and the immortality of the soul. Epicurus sought to dispel these notions, 
teaching that the soul can only exist as part of the body, fundamentally intertwined with it. When the body dies, he says, the soul must die with it, since it is no longer supported by the mass of atoms it inhabited. Thus, if the soul cannot live on after death, then death is nothing to fear. Oblivion is neutral, painless, and imperceptible. Epicurus's philosophy rejected the possibility of an afterlife where the soul resided in the abode of Hades. He never denied the existence of deities, a thought which would have been inconceivable in his day, but he did teach that the gods were not the way that people pictured them, anthropomorphized superbeings who fought in human wars and coupled with humans to create demigods. The gods, says Epicurus, are beyond our understanding and imagination. They exist, but we can never see them or know their true nature. They're far away from us, and they don't care about human affairs at all. Why fear angering a being whose very nature is above anger? Why offer sacrifice to the gods as if they needed humans to provide them with sustenance? Why seek to please something that exists outside of any emotional concept of pleasure? No, he says, we shouldn't waste our time modifying our behavior to suit the imagined vicissitudes of divine mood swings. Our focus should be on our immediate surroundings and sensations, which are the only reliable sources of knowledge we have. Epicurean pleasure, at its core, is a philosophy of the present moment. True contentment comes only from engaging the senses in worthwhile pursuits and finding joy in whatever is in front of you. Anxiety makes a bad situation unbearable and robs a good situation of its joy. Therefore, if you release anxiety and accept your present situation, you'll find almost anything easy to handle and enjoyable to experience. Epicurus had little interest in sexual pleasure, romantic attachment, and procreation. He preferred the company of friends and students. As the Roman poet Horace, a later student of his doctrine, once wrote, I would compare nothing, so long as I'm healthy, to the pleasure of a friend. Epicureans put friendship at the core of ataraxia, since the pleasures of life are hardly enjoyable alone. Sharing a meal with good friends, discussing philosophy, and helping each other achieve their highest potential all brought ataraxia to the practitioner. Friends were encouraged to be honest with each other and correct each other's shortcomings. Friends provided mutual self-improvement in a supportive environment, with everyone working towards the goals of greater understanding and acceptance of reality. Epicurus himself said, Friendship dances around the world, indeed inviting all of us to wake ourselves up to happiness. Epicurus died in Athens in 270 BCE after a painful illness, and the garden was taken over by his successor, Hermarchus. Diogenes Laertius reproduced Epicurus's will, in which he makes provisions for the school, the children of his friends, and his philosophical heirs. In it, he expressed his wish for the garden to carry on the tradition of celebrating his birthday each year with a community meal, which they did. After Epicurus, the garden and its philosophical teachings grew in popularity, especially in the last days of the Roman Republic. The poet Lucretius recorded Epicurus's teachings for a Latin-speaking audience, in his didactic poem De Rerum Natura, possibly referencing a lost work of Epicurus called Perifuseos, or On Nature. 
The writings of the first century Epicurean Philodemus, discovered in a cache in Herculaneum in the mid-18th century, have proven indispensable to the modern study of the doctrines. Epicurus himself became a culture hero, revered by later students almost as a god in his own right, something he surely would have disapproved of. His sayings, collected by Diogenes Laertius and others, were considered divine oracles, and his likeness was popular in artwork and especially personal adornments. But although his followers revered him as an enlightened sage, his detractors continued to accuse him and his school of hedonism and a complete misunderstanding of the universe. The theory of the mortality of the soul was a particular point of contention for early and medieval Christians, who all but destroyed any trace of Epicurus's original writings. Dante situates Epicurus and his crowd in the sixth circle of hell for suggesting that the soul dies with the body and that there is no afterlife. The term Epicurean became an insult, almost synonymous with atheist, used liberally during the religious conflicts between Protestants and Catholics. In the 1600s, a French Catholic priest named Pierre Gassendi published modernized versions of Epicurus's philosophies, sidestepping the theological difficulties and focusing on morality and epistemology. The term Epicurean now described someone with refined tastes, who enjoys the pleasures of life and indulges the senses. His ethical doctrines influenced prominent writers like Thomas Jefferson and Karl Marx. Enlightenment thinkers adopted Epicurus's methodology of relying only on sensory observation to prove scientific theories. And as you may have guessed by now, his theory of atoms became the basis of modern theories of matter. Epicurus's teachings were both influential and controversial from the start. Sometimes mischaracterized as a glutton and an intellectual thief, Epicurus's primary goal was to help as many people as he could achieve ataraxia and aponia, through truth grounded in our present experience. The cure for anxiety, he taught, can be achieved through four basic principles, collected by his students in the Tetrapharmakos. 1. Don't fear God. 2. Don't worry about death. 3. What is good is easy to get. And 4. What is terrible is easy to endure. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you can let me know by leaving a thumbs up down below and chatting as always in the comments. What do you think of Epicurus' teachings? Was he an enlightened sage or a hedonistic glutton? Let me know your thoughts down below. If you liked this video and you want to see more content on Greco-Roman belief, magic, philosophy, religion, feel free to subscribe to this channel. I post content like this all the time. Thanks so much for watching. I really do appreciate you, and I will see you in the next video.